Hello, hello. Check. Back front, check. Welcome to the Gathering Baptist Church. We are a church made up of those who are growing in relationship with the Father. We want to worship together through singing, praying, giving, and hearing the Word of God preached. We are biblical in that we believe that the Word of God is perfect and sufficient in all its teachings. It is living, active, and inspired by the Holy Spirit through authors that had their love of the Creator in common. We are missional and support 17 local missions in the Kansas City area, as well as 17 national and international mission partners throughout the United States and around the globe. We are a relational church and love gathering around the table and fellowship, as well as understand that the church is a place where we can come as we are and know that we are loved and understood. In the book of Acts, Luke writes in chapter 2 that the fellowship of believers devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. It also said that believers had everything in common with one another, with praising God and having favor with all people. We hope that the gathering feels like home because you're amongst family. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for joining us for worship. If you don't know who I am, if you're a first-time guest or visiting, my name is Matt Brown. I'm the family pastor here at the Gathering Baptist Church. It's lovely to see all of you here this morning. We have a few things coming up that we're excited about. Tomorrow uh, is Men's Chiefs and Chili Night at Nolan Road. The Chiefs are playing the Eagles, and I'm sure that we will win again. But you're going to want to join us to watch that game tomorrow night at the Nolan Road campus. It starts, the game time is 7.15, but you can show up early, 7 o'clock or so. Bring a chili if you want to. If not, there'll be plenty of food there. It's a whole lot of fun. So men, and hey, men, you can bring your sons as well. So it'd just, it'd just be a whole lot of fun tomorrow night at the Nolan Road campus. Women, we also have something coming up for you. Christmas night of worship is December 1st, also at the Nolan Road, Nolan Road campus at 7 p.m. Also, kids, you can be a part of this as well. We're having a children's choir that's going to sing a few songs that you guys have been learning for the Women's Night of Worship, so parents, be sure to sign your kids up for that. But women, you're going to have a great night. There's a cheesecake bar following the program in the Connection Cafe, so women, you're not going to want to miss out on that. Please sign up for that before November 24th. With that being said, 
I'd like to open us this service up with a passage from Daniel this morning. We spend a whole lot of time in church talking about the cross and looking back at the cross, and for very good reason, because that's where our redemption was purchased. That's where Christ atoned for our sin. That's the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But oftentimes we don't look forward to what is coming for us at the end of time, at the end of history for all of believers. So I want to read this passage to you from Daniel chapter 7. It says this, Daniel speaking in verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the great hope for all believers that we have, that one day we will be reunited with Christ. He will come and get us. And we will be members of this everlasting kingdom, saints that reign with him forevermore. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what we look forward to as a church. So let's pray this morning as we open our service. Father God, we come before you this morning. You are holy, you are righteous. Your judgment is true and just. God, we do look back on the cross and are so grateful for what you accomplished on that. Thank you for sending Jesus to live the perfect life that we cannot live and then to sacrifice himself for us. We also look forward to the promise that Jesus will return, that all things will be made new and believers will reign with him forevermore in your everlasting kingdom. We will be in glory with you forever. God, it's promised and we know it to be true because you promise it and you cannot go back on your word. So thank you for that this morning. God, as we open up this service, I pray that the spirit would be in this place like we know he already is. God, as we sing songs to you, that they would be pleasing. As Pastor Nate preaches your word, may, may you speak through him. May it not be his words, but your words. May the Spirit transform each one of our lives to grow us to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together as we lift our voices in praise. takes our brokenness and makes us whole again, who turns the darkness into light, only Jesus, who takes our emptiness and fills us up again, who traded death to give me life, only no other truth, no other way, no other hope, no other name. Who alone is worthy? Who alone is holy? Only Jesus, only Jesus.
Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Be in one God of glory Majesty the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, and we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I judge and I defend, suffered and crucified. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious night, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe.
and someone who is our creator, our sustainer, the giver of life and breath and meaning and salvation to us. God, may we not forget, but rejoice in the truths that we read, the truths that we sing, the time that we spend interceding for each other, May we remember that we rest in you. We find our peace and our strength and our hope and our salvation in you and in you alone. Pray this in your name. Amen. See, my name is A. I'm one of the pastors here. Pardon my voice this morning. I hope it stays with me. Uh, I started coaching uh, JV and varsity basketball, assistant coaching here at Plaza, and I never realized how much I yell. Uh, so I lost my voice this week um, yelling at kids. Uh, so this morning, if I don't yell at you, that's why. So uh, good morning. Glad, glad to be with you. Open your Bibles to John chapter 11. So we continue our study through the Gospel of John. It's starting next Sunday. We're going to take a break from John. Um, because it's almost Christmas, and so we're actually starting a Christmas sermon series that will take us through the end of the year, and starting back in January, we will pick back up in chapter 12, all right? So we'll be in chapter 11 uh, this morning. So um, I was thinking about this this week, friendship. Uh, the Hebrew word for friendship is rea, rea, and it's a powerful word in the Hebrew, but in the English language, friend is um, not as powerful. Um, rea in Hebrew, it's much deeper, much deeper. When Hebrews used the word rea, they meant someone that you are connected in a deep relationship with. It's, it's deep companionship. And I think in our culture, in English culture, in the West, it's kind of lost that idea. Um, it, it's much looser. I don't want to brag, all right, but I got on my Facebook page this week, and I have 1,700, as of this morning, 1,790 friends. Don't want to brag. Don't want to brag. Maybe you're one of them. If you're not, help me get to 1,800. That'd really help my <laughs> algorithms. Um, no, I hardly get on Facebook, do much anymore. But I, I got on there to, to, to check how many friends I have. Part of me is kind of like, well, that's pretty good. Part of me is like, that's it, you know? And then I started, you know, you can go to this button where you can see, like, your friend list. I started looking through them, and I, like, the first couple pages, I didn't know who they were. I was like, they're friends? Where did I even meet this person? I have no idea. So I click on their photo. I'm like, I kind of remember that person. I have no idea. So I, I wonder how many people in my friends list are actual real friends, but they're considered friends, right? Because in our culture, friends are just people you've met or people that you like or have similarities with. Or at one time, you had some connection, and then you joined and became friends on Facebook and never once talked again. And so we've kind of lost this idea of friends, True friendship. And true friendship is this super valuable thing. Um, the ancient Roman statesman Cicero wrote this. Life is nothing without friendship. With the exception of wisdom, I am inclined to think nothing better than friendship has been given to man by the immortal gods. Thomas Aquinas said, There is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. Proverbs 27, 9 says, the sweetness of friendship refreshes the soul. It's true, right? It's true. What a blessing it is to have those true friends. Not the Facebook friends, not the people you have acquaintances. I'm talking about the ones that you're close with, the ones like Rhea, you're connected deeply with, this deep companionship. And I'll tell you, it's something that it's been uh, the number one thing outside of my 
kids' salvation and knowing the Lord and following after him, outside of their salvation, this is the number one thing that I've prayed for for my kids, Kingston and Ruby, is that they would have deep friendships because that's what I had. And I look back on my life and how screwed up I would have been more than I am now without people that kept me grounded, without people that supported me, without people that were there for me, right? You probably have those type of people. And they're, they're very few because they're, it, it's, it's, it's not just Facebook friends. This is something that's deep companionship. To me, I think you've reached that level of deep friendship with someone when you can go to their refrigerator and uh, help yourself. You got those kind of friends? I do. Um, go to the refrigerator, you help yourself, you can take your shoes off in their home, kick your feet up, you don't worry if the house is picked up, if they're coming over, you aren't concerned about what outfit you're wearing when they're hanging out with you, right? You can wear your pajamas and your uh, slippers. It's just fine. Why? Because you know that they're your friends. They know you. They're like a extended family, right? You have those kind of friends? I did. I do. Jesus had friends like that. Jesus had friends like that. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before. Maybe we might even wonder if the Son of God would actually need friends. I mean, I mean, we, we need them, but what, why would he need friends? He didn't really have time to pursue friendships. He's got a lot of Messiah stuff to do, right? He didn't have time to kick it around and just shoot the breeze and get to know somebody. He's, he's on his way to the cross. He's got healing stuff to do. He's got miracles to work on. He's praying all the time. It's just, he doesn't have time for that kind of stuff. So we start to wonder, did Jesus really care about that kind of thing? But if you read the Gospels, we actually find Jesus seems to have enjoyed friendship very much. We sometimes forget the humanity side of Jesus, being fully God, but also fully man, and the friendships that he had. In fact, it seems there was a specific group of friends that Jesus was on a deeper level with than anybody else. He had access to their refrigerator. When they, when they hung out, he could, he could relax, he could kick back, he could put his feet up on their ottoman and watch the football game with these people. This is what the relationship was. In the Gospels, it seems like these reyes, these deep companions, were these three siblings that lived together in a town called Bethany. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We think that the 12 disciples were probably some pretty good friends. But if you read the Gospels, I'm sure if he was like me, he'd be like, I kind of just want to get away from these guys for a little bit. Okay? And maybe these three friends were kind of these people he could just breathe and relax with. They were super close. Perhaps outside of the 12 disciples, these three people were his best friends. And he loved them very much and would do anything for them. Because that's what friends do, right? These close friends I'm talking about, I can go to the refrigerator. Their kids sleep over at our house all the time. They leave their stuff at our house all the time. These type of friendships take years to develop. If they called me right now, I would leave here and I'd go to them. Wouldn't you? That's what you do. That's what you do with close friends. Jesus had that. In our story this morning, tragedy is going to strike this family. And perhaps Jesus' best earthly friend falls ill. And naturally, Mary and Martha send for their friend. That's all they know what to do. Their friend who they had seen heal multitudes of people. Jesus is going to come. After all, it's his friend. He's, he's going to be here. But he doesn't. He doesn't until it's too late. And he's only a day's journey away, but he purposely waits two extra days. It's like he waits for him to die on purpose. Why would he do that? I thought we were closer than that. Why, why, why is God doing this? It's a story of tragedy. It's a story of, of pain. It's a story of questioning Jesus on what in the world he is doing. How could you allow this to happen? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Jesus' best friends were. But it's also a story that shows us Jesus' humanity and also, at the end, his deity and his power in the resurrection. It's a lot of verses this morning, but we're going to cover this amazing, amazing story, and I hope that you're encouraged with it. Before we do, let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, this time we have to open your word today. I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would um, fill me up, Lord. I pray that you would be among us and speak to our hearts today. Help us to be encouraged by Jesus today. Help us to see his love and his mercy and also his power as we open your word today. 
It's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Since we'll be spending time this morning with this family, Bethany, I think, I think it's appropriate and a good idea for us to get to know them uh, for just a moment. And since they're, they're mentioned quite a bit, in all four Gospels, this family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are mentioned. So start with Lazarus. Although Lazarus is mentioned in all four of the Gospels, we never hear him say anything. No, no Gospel author quotes him. And I, I find that interesting because if I'm a writer and I'm wanting an investigator or a journalist, he's the guy I want to interview, wouldn't you? Think about it. This is a guy who rose from the dead. He experienced that and came back to tell about it. I want to know what in the world happened. I want to know where he went, what was it like there, tell us what it was like to hear that voice of Jesus, what was that like? I would want to have him speak at our church, right? As a guest speaker. But it's interesting that he's not in the Gospels of saying anything, not quoted in any way. I just find that interesting. Lazarus is famous for what happens in this chapter. During this chapter, Lazarus gets ill and he dies. And four days later is publicly raised from the dead. And as we'll see in January, if you want to read ahead to chapter 12, we see him again. And his family, Mary and Martha, they hold a dinner party in Jesus' honor. After all, he raised their brother from the dead. The least they could do is have a dinner party to celebrate a big thank you, right? So they have him over for a big dinner celebration. Lazarus was dead. He was raised. And we're celebrating his new life. The story tells us that Lazarus is seated with Jesus. And John tells us that a large crowd came to see them both. Perhaps hundreds or even thousands of people. Think about the news that would just spread about what happened here. And they're having this dinner party. And both these people in the same room, we got to go see this. And the Bible tells us in this chapter that so powerful was Lazarus' witness that the Pharisees, those hostile authorities who were wanting to kill Jesus the chapter before, remember? They're plotting to kill him. Because of Lazarus' witness, they add to the wanted list, Lazarus. The Pharisees not only want to kill Jesus, but they want to kill Lazarus again. Verse 11, chapter 12. Why do they want to do this? John tells us, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. People were coming to believe in Jesus because of the witness of this man who was once dead, but is now alive. And what a lesson that is for all that. Like, we could just preach a sermon just on that, right? What a lesson this is for us. Listen, if you're a believer in Christ, the gospel tells us that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were that dead person. But he has risen us to life, right? He made us alive. We are then witnesses. So the question is, are people coming to faith because of your story, because of your resurrection from death to life? Lazarus did. And here's the deal. You might say, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a teacher, I don't, I don't know how to speak. Lazarus didn't. We have no recording of him preaching a sermon or giving a message. What we have is him living out this witness of the resurrected life. So it's a great lesson there for us. James Montgomery Boyce says, you should be especially careful that your life demonstrates the reality of the spiritual resurrection that Jesus has performed in you so that others might turn to him and believe in him because of what they see in you. Right? Lazarus. See another character, Martha. Martha is the sister of Lazarus, probably most famous for the story you know in Luke's gospel, where Jesus is at their house. This is previously before all these things took place. Jesus is at their house, and Martha's the one working really hard, right? She's cleaning, she's preparing, she's taking care of things. But her sister Mary is not helping, right? She's at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching, something that only really disciples did, really only men did. And here's Mary, how dare she not help me? And she's doing something that she should not be doing. Martha's pretty ticked. So then Martha then says to Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Whew. She's telling Jesus what to do here. Right? Martha's a classic example of someone who has a heart of service, but is really caught up in herself. Look, notice in that verse how many times she uses these personal pronouns just in this one sentence. My, me, alone, me. Right? Martha's 
this classic example is caught up in herself. She loved Jesus, but she thought everyone else should love Jesus the way she loves Jesus. But in this story, in John 11, something's going to change in Martha. Much like Lazarus' witness uh, was transformed by his resurrection, before that people didn't really listen to Lazarus. Now he's the talk of the town. And it, because of his witness, because of his resurrection and the witness of that, people are coming to faith so much so that the Pharisees see him as a threat equal with Jesus. Something happened, his resurrection. Well, same thing kind of happens to Martha. Because in chapter 12, the very next chapter, Martha's hosting again. She's hosting Jesus again. She's serving dinner. Jesus present. Mary, once again, is at the feet of Jesus. Same scenario. But this time, there's no complaint. This time, there's no complaint. The resurrection of her brother seems to have turned her mind away from her selfishness and allowed her to serve in the way she serves joyfully to the Lord. This is Martha. Mary. Practically every time we see Mary in the gospel, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is the posture of a disciple. In Luke 10, we are talking about Mary is seated at, the, at Jesus' feet. Here in John 11, when Jesus arrives at the funeral, Mary falls at Jesus' feet. And at the dinner banquet in chapter 12, she's at the feet once again, and she anoints Jesus' feet, washing his feet with her hair. And before her brother's resurrection, she was at his feet because she wanted to learn from him. She was, he was the teacher. But as her, after Lazarus was raised, she recognizes Christ's divinity and she worships him. You see how this resurrection story changes these people's lives. These three people that were not really known become these great witnesses of Jesus because of the resurrection. These are the characters in the story, but they're not the main character. So for the remainder of the time, I actually want to focus on the main character, and the main character's name is Jesus. After all, all these things are written, John says, so that you can believe that he is the Son of God. So he's the focus here. And so what I want to do this morning is I want you to look at four truths with me, four truths that this story teaches us about our Lord. Okay, four truths. First, this is verses 1 through 16. First point is this, what we can learn about our Lord. In his delay, he is loving us. In his delay, he is loving us. Let's read this passage together, verse 1 through 16. It will be on the screen for you as well. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going to go there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the light, in the night, excuse me, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they, had, they thought he meant he was taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Now there's a lot here. I wish we had time to unpack all this, like Jesus' response to the disciples' concern about going to the area where he, they tried to kill him, as well as Thomas's bold statement here that we're ready to die with him, they fully expected that he's going to die, so we're going to we're going to die with him, which is ironic. In just a few chapters, when he is actually dying, they run. But what I really want to focus on is this, verse three through six, because that's where I'm puzzled. Lazarus, remember, possibly Jesus' best friend, has become ill, so ill that in verse three, the sisters sent for Jesus. Now notice they didn't send an invitation or even a request. They didn't say, "Lord 
Jesus, would you please come? Look at it closely. They didn't ask that. They didn't, they didn't ask him, please, could you come? The message is actually a statement. They said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. It's a statement, a request. The statement is an assumption that as soon as the Lord hears this statement, he would hurry. Why? Because it's his closest friend. The one you love is ill. Nothing more needs to be said. He's coming, right? Because that's what friends do. Informing him will be enough. He will be here because he loves him more than anything else. Verse 4 through 6 tells us the response. This is where it's puzzling. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. It's kind of a strange response, right, to the message. It seems like he passes it off as this, guys, just don't worry about it. It's just a cold. Okay, it's not life-threatening, which makes this even more confusing because he actually does die from it. So is Jesus wrong? Did he get a wrong diagnosis here? Or did he, was he saying something else? But then an even stranger comment is in verse 5. It says, now Jesus loved Mary and her sisters and Lazarus. So when he heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. This is where I'm puzzled. The word John uses here for loved is the word agapeo. You've probably heard of that. It's the Greek word that describes unstoppable love. It's the highest type of love. It's the God type love that he has for us, agape. This isn't phileo love. That's like a friendship love. This is agape, God type love. And it's also in the active tense, which means it's a love with action. So if it's a love with action, we would expect the next verse in the scriptures to say, when Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he immediately went to one of his disciples, commanded him to find a horse, ride as fast as he could to be with Lazarus. That's what we expect to happen. Why? Because we think love in action means immediacy. Don't we? But that's not what the text says. The text says that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus with the deepest agape love that he actively stayed away. Strange, isn't it? Actively stayed away. Then later he says that he was glad that he stayed away. So, so I begin to ask myself, were they not as close as we think? Were they just kind of like Facebook friends? It's like, well, I got, I mean, kind of inconvenient right now. Got a lot of Messiah stuff to do. He's probably going to be fine. Is that, is that what's happening? I don't, I don't think so. It says that he loved them. Why does he do this? It's a remarkable combination. Jesus loved him, so he waited two more days for him to die. We're told Jesus waited because he loved him, not because he's too busy, not because he was incapable of doing anything about it, not because he was ignoring them or he didn't care. These were his best friends. And Jesus waited because he loved them. This blows away all of our human understanding perceptions of love. We would say that's, that's not love. Love is when the hero comes in to save the day. When the situation is most dire, the loving hero swoops in and rescues. The hero doesn't let people die. He at the very least makes an attempt and certainly doesn't hold back when he knows he can help. That's not what a hero does. And that's not what a loving friend does. Have you been there? Have you cried out to God, the one you read about in the Bible, who rescues other people, but he never seems to rescue you? Maybe you resonate with C.S. Lewis when he writes, I've mentioned this before, but I love this idea. It's in his book he wrote called Grief Observed. It's on the screen here. C.S. Lewis says this. But go to him, God, when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. And then after that, silence. You may as well turn away. The long, longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There's no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once, and that seeming was as though as through this. What can this mean? Why is he so present, a commander in our time of prosperity, and so absent, a help in our time of trouble? You ever felt that? When you're knocking on the door, Jesus, you said to come to you. 
I'm coming to you, I'm knocking on the door, and you don't hear anything. The only hearing you hear is the sound of a lock turning, clicking. And not just one, another one. And you're looking through the windows and the lights turn out. And you're calling out and he's not answering. Does anybody even live here? Have you ever been there? If you have, you might get a sense of what maybe Mary and Martha were feeling in this moment. But in John 11 and in so many other scriptures, they clearly claim, though, that these delays are delays of love. And I know we don't understand that. I don't understand it. But example after example, think of Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers does everything right, rises up to a level where he's serving Potiphar in his house, and then he's falsely accused. He does the right thing, and Potiphar's wife lies, and he's sent to prison for two years. No answer, nothing, and he's stuck in this dungeon. What what are you doing, Lord? I, I thought if I honored you, you would bless me. No, you're in the dungeon for two years. But we know the end of the story where he rises up to the ranks being second command of all of Egypt, and he provides for his family during a famine. How God had this huge arc, this huge story. He had no idea of what God was doing. Think of Paul. Paul in the thorn in the flesh. He cried out to God, said, will you remove this thorn in my flesh? And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. See, sometimes Jesus' delay is actually a delay of love. Why? So the Son of God may be glorified in it. He says to his disciples, I'm glad I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. He's doing something bigger. Jesus is saying, I see things you cannot see. I have a bigger story than you can even imagine. Listen, it would have been good for Jesus to have come to Bethany and heal Lazarus. But we wouldn't be talking about that healing today probably. You know why? Because Jesus healed a lot of people. He did this all the time in this manner. Now this time he's going to do something greater. This time he's going to do something that they didn't see or understand in the moment. But by delaying, he's actually loving them. C.S. Lewis, that quote I mentioned earlier, he answers his own question in grief observed. He says, though, but suppose that what you are up against is a surgeon. God is like a surgeon whose intentions are holy Good. The kinder and more conscientious he is, the more inexorably he will go on cutting. If he yielded to your entreaties, if he stopped before the operation was complete, all the pain up to that point would have been useless. God is like a surgeon. He's doing something we can't understand. His delay is loving. And though we don't understand it, it's loving. That's one truth that you need to hear today. That just because he's not answering does not mean he does not love you, or he doesn't hear you, or he doesn't care, or he's mad at you. He's actually loving you. Number two from this story. Another truth is that Jesus welcomes our complaints. Do you like when people complain to you? I don't really like when my kids complain to me. Do you? And so we carry that in with our Heavenly Father. I don't like people that complain to me and say what they really feel. I like it better when they sugarcoat things or even outright lie and say they really love everything that I do and they just they think I'm just this great guy. I'm a great father and I'm just the funniest guy, you know, best looking, most talented. I love, I love when people say that, right? You do too. So we carry this with our Heavenly Father. We, we don't like to air our honest feelings toward Him, but what I find in this passage is that Jesus actually welcomes our complaints. It's this response and interaction with Martha. Look at verse 17 through 27. Verse 14 says that Jesus told the disciples plainly that Lazarus had died. It's been two days since the messengers came. Jesus has died. And now Jesus says, okay, now it's time to go to Bethany. And the disciples are like, now? Like, what are we going to do now? He's dead. You're only risking your life. Let's, Let's not go. Jesus says, no, now, now's the time to go when he's dead. Strange. So this is the scene, verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for, two, for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. By the way, Jesus was only about a day's journey away. Two miles. It wasn't like he was, hey, I'm, I'm stuck at the airport in Ontario, can't get there. Sorry, wish I could be there. I'd get the first flight. No, he could walk there in a day. 
but he waits. Now it's day four. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming to the world. Once again, there's a lot here, but I want to focus in on just this conversation with Martha. Martha says, you can almost hear her pain screaming out. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Feel the weight of this. Feel the weight of her expecting, I'm going to sin for Jesus. Your friend is ill, the one you love, he will come. Can you imagine her and Mary going to the door, going to the window? Is he here yet? I don't see anybody. Where is he? For days. Where is he? It's in that pain, in that anger, disappointment. As she says this, do you feel the statement she is saying? It's probably a statement that she said many times between her and Mary. In fact, if you look later on, we'll see in a minute, Mary says the exact same phrase when she goes to Jesus. Exact same words. So you got to think these words were uttered for two or three days, back and forth. Where is he? I don't know. If he'd be here, he would live. So they just, they just say it. Do you see him? No. When is he going to get here? The messengers, the sisters sent to Jesus, return without him. You expect them when the messengers come back, like, oh, the messengers are coming. Here he is. He's not. He didn't come with them. He remained. Okay, well, what did, what did he say? What, what did Jesus tell you? Is that he's going to come later today? No, no. He said, this illness will not lead to death. So, so does this mean he's going to get better? So it's like, we don't need to worry? And then he dies. He doesn't get better. He dies. So you can imagine the hurt of Jesus not coming and the confusion in Martha's mind of Jesus giving them wrong information. Falsely, maybe even making them think positively things are going to get better, and they don't. Letting them down altogether. Do you feel the frustration and the anger and the hurt? By all appearances, Jesus was wrong. The sickness did lead to death, and also he's insensitive because he didn't come right away. And so she complains. Where were you? Why didn't you come? And I think this is an important truth to recognize here because I think Christians think sometimes that's wrong for a believer to speak so frankly to the Lord. Doesn't complaining to God show that you really don't trust him? Doesn't it actually show a lack of faith? But I want you to notice closely what Martha's complaint is in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. It's complaint and anger with, but I know that you're doing something. I don't, I don't like it. I hate it. I don't understand it. But, but I know you're doing something. But I'm not happy with you. And I want you to notice Her response to Jesus should sound familiar to those who read the Old Testament. Because the Psalms and Lamentations are perfect examples of this. We often think of our complaints or our laments are not faith. If that's so, then why are one-third of the Psalms laments or complaints to God? Remember, the Psalms are Israel's hymn book. These are their worship songs. And a third of them are complaints to God, things like, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? How long am I knocking on this door and I hear those locks turn? How long? Why have you forsaken me? You've turned the lights out in the house. Do you hear me? Where are you, Lord? These are all throughout the Psalms. And these are the songs that Israel would sing to God in worship. So what Martha is actually doing, she's, a, she's singing like Israel did to God. She's like Israel would sing to God in her complaints to God. Martha is singing in her complaints to Jesus. 
professor of mine, Dr. Rodney Reeves, paraphrases this section in Martha's idea of this complaint in faith. He, he says, I feel like she's saying it this way. You are faithful, but you let me down. You never forsake us, but I feel like you're leaving me hanging. You're good, but this is bad. You love us, but I wonder why you weren't here to help us. Your life, but my brother is dead. Do you feel it? But I want you to notice, verse 23, how Jesus responds. The Lord does not berate her for her words, complaint, her honesty. He simply says, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. He goes on to tell her the fifth I am statement in this gospel. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha replies with one of the greatest confessions in the New Testament, actually. In this moment of pain, she responds in this great confession. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. In other words, she's saying, I don't understand what you are doing. I'm in pain and I'm hurting, but I trust you. Her complaints are actually a sign of faith. So Christian, why do we think that it's wrong to speak frankly with the Lord when we're commanded to cast all of our burdens, all of our anxieties on him? Why? Because he cares for you. Why does he command us of that? And then would he get onto us for using that command? Christ longs for us to come to him with all of our honest emotions because he cares for us. Jesus welcomes our lament. And it's actually a sign of faith. Third one, Jesus enters into our pain. Jesus enters into our pain. This is the Lord's interaction with Mary. Verse 28, when she said this, she went and called her sister Mary saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? See this interaction with Mary, interacted with Martha. Now he seeks Mary, who's grieving in private, which was custom. Stay in the home and the crowd. They, they follow Mary out to Jesus. I want you to notice there in verse 32, Mary comes to Jesus and once again falls at his feet and says the exact same phrase that Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus responds to Mary differently, doesn't he? This is what he did with Martha. See, I think Martha, Jesus knew she needed truth. They were friends. He knew what Martha needed. And right in that moment, she just needed to hear truth. She wanted him to speak, give an answer. She needed answers, but Jesus knows Mary. And how he responds, verse 33, is, is amazing. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. He didn't give a lot of truth. He didn't make any statements. He simply entered in to the pain. Scholars say that when Jesus was being deeply moved in spirit, that word there, the term they would use is the term they would also use for a snorting horse. So when taken into context, this, this, this implies that Jesus let out an involuntary gasp. That the wind just literally came out of him. He saw Mary weeping. He saw her pain. He saw that it was, ca it was causing all those around to have pain and their emotions, and he involuntarily gasped like a snorting horse uncontrollably. This is how deep the pain was in Christ. He literally felt their sorrow with everything he had. Verse 35, the shortest verse in all of the Bible. It was my favorite one whenever I had to do, you have to memorize verses. I'm like, I got this one, Jesus wept. Verse 34 is the smallest, shortest verse in all the Bible, but it might be the most powerful verse in all the Bible. 
Both the Roman and Greek cultures of the time believed gods were disconnected from humanity. The ancient Greeks described their gods with this word, apatheia, apatheia. It's a word we actually get our word apathy. It means emotionless. It means indifference. This is how they viewed their gods. They were indifferent to anything that's going on with us. They described them that way because the gods can't feel emotions like anger or disappointment or hope. Because they reason that if God can be made to feel sorrow, then someone else has an effect on him. Therefore, they're really the ones who have power over God. They can affect what God does. Therefore, gods can't have emotions. Deity, therefore, can have no emotions. But these two words, Jesus wept, shatter this reasoning. It separates Christianity and our God, the true God, from any other gods. See, our God is one who weeps, who does identify with the pain of his people. The other gods do not. They are separate. They are apatheia. But Christ weeps. And we're told that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1. Hebrews 1 says he is the exact imprint of God's nature. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when Jesus weeps here, he shows us a God who is not distant from those who are in pain, but he enters into our pain. This isn't just the humanity side of Jesus and the deity side of Jesus is indifferent. No, no, this is Jesus, God. This is what God does. When God sees our pain, he enters in. He weeps with us. See, we think there's no crying in heaven. There is crying in heaven. In fact, we don't see no crying in heaven until Revelation 21, I believe, when he wipes away the tears from our eyes. Right now, there are people crying in heaven. When are you going to avenge our blood? And so when you're in pain, God is weeping with you. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of relationship. He didn't weep because he was in shock. Jesus didn't weep because he was unsure of what the future holds of this life without his friend. It finally just hit him that Lazarus is not going to be here anymore. That's not why he starts crying all of a sudden. He wept because he felt the pain of what death had done to his friends. He was weeping because they were weeping. And the most remarkable part of this is that Jesus knows in just a few minutes he's going to do something that takes away all this suffering and all this pain totally. But before he fixes the problem, he joins in their pain. I find that remarkable. He enters into their grief before he takes the grief away. And what this teaches us is that we don't have a God who looks on us and disinterestedly when we grieve. But a God who weeps when we weep. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 6, 8, the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. Psalm 9, uh, 9, 12, he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Listen, we have a Savior who weeps when we weep, one who enters into our pain. He's not a distant God, but a close one. Number four, and lastly, the power of death is no match for the power of Jesus. This is another truth we need to know. The power of death is no match for the power of of Jesus. When we see Jesus depicted in artwork and paintings, it's almost always this passive and detached Jesus. He's got a halo and he's kind of on another, he's like, these guys annoy me, but I'm here for a while to go to the cross and just got to deal with this right now. Okay, it's just kind of this detached thing. But as Jesus approaches the grave of this friend, the Greek text describes him as approaching the grave like a warrior going to battle. That's the tense in the Greek. Here's what I mean. Verse 33. Uh, said that Jesus, seeing Mary and the Jews weeping, that he was deeply moved. And then verse 38 says, again, that he was deeply moved again. That word is imbri maumai. Imbri maumai. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Dad. Greek scholar back there. Imbri maumai, which means anger. You're like, well, why didn't they put that in my translation? Mine says deeply moved. Well, a lot of scholars, a lot of commentaries on this this week, almost all the scholars and all those commentaries are like, we're mad at the Bible translators because they're trying to soften the word here. Because we don't like Jesus being angry. We just like him deeply moved. Okay? But the term there is anger. So Jesus isn't approaching this tomb deeply moved. He's approaching it in anger. Like a warrior. He, what's he angry at? Is he angry at Mary? 
to angry at Martha for their lack of faith. Have you not seen what I've done? Gosh, you have little faith. I'm just ticked off right now. Is he angry with the people? All these mourners that are there, they not learned anything. None of these would make any sense in this context. Jesus approaches the tomb because he is angry at death. He is angry at death. Have you ever lost anybody to cancer? I've lost friends, family members to cancer. You know what? I hate cancer. Don't you? Don't you hate it? That anger you have towards this? Why? Because it steals from you. This is what Jesus is angry at. He's seeing the wreckage that death does to his friends, so he's angry. And it's time to go to war. B.B. Warfield writes, Jesus approached the grave of Lazarus in a state, not of uncontrollable grief, but inexpressible anger. The emotion which tore his breast and clamored for utterance was just rage. It is death that is the object of his anger, and behind death, him who has the power of death, and whom he had come into the world to destroy. Tears of sympathy may fill his eyes, but his soul is held by rage, and he advances the tomb, in Calvin's words, as a champion who prepares for conflict. Herman Ritterbrough says, Jesus in essence is saying, enough now of tears and wailing. Enough honor has been disposed upon death. Against the power of death, God's glory will now enter into the arena. This is the context that Jesus sees this. He weeps. He feels their pain. And then we read. Then Jesus, deeply moved, again, angry, verse 38, came to the tomb. He steps into the arena. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. This is, this is, are you, what are you doing? It would be the equivalent of opening a casket, digging back up, let's open the casket. Everybody's like, That's, that, is that right? Should we do that? Isn't that dishonoring the body? Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So he prays so that they can all hear. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man that had died came out, and his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus didn't use a regular tone of voice. He didn't whisper an invitation to the corpse. We are told that he cried out with a loud voice. He shouted. This is a command of a warrior saying, Lazarus, come out. The best comment I read this week on this verse was of C.H. Spurgeon. It's on the screen here. I love this. He said this. And the life. Lazarus, just you, come out. Because I have the power to raise everybody from the dead. But just you specifically, you right there, Lazarus, you come out. In just this one chapter, we see this human side of Jesus, his friendships, these close friendships. He's entering to the pain of his friends. He's weeping alongside them. We see the mercy of Jesus. He's identifying with them and entering in. And then we see his divinity and his power. Simply saying three words, Lazarus, come out. Out shows that death is no match for the power of Jesus. This foe, this death, that's literally batting a thousand. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody that's lived has died. They're batting a thousand. Death takes the rich. It takes the poor. It takes the healthy. It takes the sick. It takes the young. It takes the old. It takes the prominent. It takes the obscure. It takes the strong. It takes the weak. Death is powerful, but death to Jesus is no match. We can try to stay away from it. We can try and eat vegan. We can try to be gluten-free. We can try to try all the medicine. We can try and extend our life, but you cannot do it. Jesus is the only one who can have power over death, and it's no match to him. Earlier, he says he likens it to sleep. Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go to wake him up. They're like, well, if he's asleep, he'll get better. No, no, he's dead. I was using it as a figure of speech. This is, this is how he treats death. It's no match for him. 
It's like sleep. It's like as challenging for him to stand before the tomb and say, Lazarus, come out. It's about as challenging as it is for me to wake up my 15-year-old son, Kingston, to get up for school and get dressed. Kingston, get up. That wasn't a challenge for me. I just raised my voice and said those three words. That's as challenging as it is for Jesus to raise from the dead over death. It's power. It's victory. That's why Paul says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Right? The power of death is no match for the power of Jesus. Listen, those who have lost loved ones to death, they haven't been resurrected like Lazarus. But 1 Thessalonians 5 says that one day when he returns, all the dead in Christ will rise. But not like Lazarus. See, Lazarus was risen again and he died again. 1 Thessalonians 5, now, now, when we're risen, when your loved one is risen from the dead, they are raised to eternal life. Revelation 21, 4 says that he will then wipe away every tear from her eyes and there will be no more pain, no more suffering, and no more death. So, until that final day, for those of us who experience pain and loss, those of us who, have, uh, who eventually will experience the pain and loss, we have a friend who enters into that pain. He is not forsaking us. He is somehow, somehow loving us. And I don't know the answer. I don't know in this life that you'll ever get the answer. But somehow, we trust him because we've seen it over and over again. And I don't like it, but I trust you. We have someone who enters into our pain. He is one who says, come to me with your questions. I can take it. Cry out your pain to me. I can take it. I will be your comforter. He wants you to share your laments with him. He wants you to cast your burdens on him. Why? Because he loves you. This passage teaches four things. The Lord's delaying is not him forsaking you. It's actually him loving you. Number two, the Lord welcomes our complaints. Number three, Jesus enters into our pain. He is with us. Number four, Jesus is more powerful than death. So here's the application we're going to sing. That's the band come on up. First is to the unbeliever in the room. Listen, you come here this morning and you say, I don't really know if I believe Christ. I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I'm just a spiritual person. That's, that's fine. We're, we're glad you're here today. But I want to speak to you specifically in this text, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He says he is the resurrection and the life. He doesn't teach about it. He doesn't have an opinion on it. He is that thing. He says, whoever believes in me, though he dies, actually he will live. Then he asked Martha, do you believe this? And I think he's asking you the same question today. He's saying, I have the power to take away your sins that lead you to death. And I have the power to resurrect your life, to make you born again. I have the power to do that. I alone have the power to do that. I can resurrect your life. And he's turning to you and saying, do you believe this? And today you can respond. I'll be at the back of the room where these lamps are, and we'll have some counselors at both ends. would love to talk to you about that if you want to know more about Christ and his atoning sacrifice for you. To the believer in the room, this text today is a text of hope. I know talking about death, talking about suffering, it's heavy. But today's a text of hope. In your prayers, you may not receive an answer. Christ is delaying. I don't know the purpose for his delay, but I do know from this story that his delaying is not a lack of concern or punishment or lack of love. Somehow, his delay is for a purpose beyond what we can see now. His delay is actually love for you. And when life hurts, you can know a couple things. It's okay to lament. It's actually good to do that. It's actually worship to lament and question what God is doing. He's big enough to handle your complaints and your laments. And number two, Jesus enters into your pain and is near to the brokenhearted. And number three, this is the hope. He is a re resurrection and a life. And one day, all things will be made new and right. De death will ultimately be completely defeated. We will never have to deal with that ever again. And we'll forever be with the one who used to weep with us. But then he's going to wipe away every tear from her eyes and will no longer weep. What hope we have in Christ. Amen? Maybe so, Lord Jesus, in our hearts today. If we respond to you, would you move among us? In Christ's name we pray. Listen, if the Lord's moving your heart, we want to pray. 
need someone to pray with. We have people back at the tables. I'll be in the back as well. Let's sing and respond. If the Lord moves in your heart, come talk to us. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Through this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Jesus. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I. night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hope. My shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won And I shall overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future should, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. Has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my belief. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is on. To this I hold, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, fill my lips, shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's been a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 
As you leave, we'd encourage you to get involved in a Bible study. If you have questions, come find me or one of the other pastors or go to those tables where there's lights on and they can get you to a Bible study. We'd love to see you. Have a great week. You're dismissed.